China entered the modern world after a century of convulsion. The imperial outreach that colonized so many parts of the world didn't actually colonize China for the most part, although the Japanese took over Manchuria and renamed it Manchukuo. But certainly a very great deal of China was imperialized, what the Chinese called unequal treaties, uh, all kinds of military and militarized governments, all kinds of warlord divisions within China itself preventing the remit of the Chinese government from extending even within its own territories that were not disputed by the imperial powers. All of these factors meant that China entered the 20th century a backward nation, an underdeveloped state in terms of being able to deal with the outside world and having grave difficulties and confusions about exactly what that outside world actually meant. And the civil wars within China among warlords between the nationalist government and then the communist rival administrations, then the war against the Japanese when the invasion of China began full throttle. All of these things meant uh, World War II of continued convulsion, a continued lack of modernity, and a continued inability actually to forge modern diplomatic relations with the outside world except on behalf of the war effort. So that as the Civil War continued after World War II, leading finally to the communist victory in 1949, you had a China that was alienated from the outside world. And this alienation was aided and abetted by the grave reluctance of the United States in particular to allow a communist ruled China to take its place as a member of the United Nations Security Council. The Americans preferred to maintain the rump nationalist government now located in exile on Taiwan as the so-called true representative of the Chinese people. And it meant putting China, as ruled by the Communist Party, into an isolation, into an international purdah. It took the Chinese on the mainland a long time to work out a strategy for engagement with the outside world and decided to do so in the first instance by interactions with the emerging world. In other words, China saw itself as an emerging nation, even though it was by far one of the largest such emerging nations. But in 1956, at the Afro-Asian summit meeting in Bandung, Indonesia, the Chinese Prime Minister Zhao Wenlai made a startling appearance and he gave a speech outlining the principles of the new Chinese foreign policy. And there are two major characteristics of great attractiveness to the Afro-Asian nations assembled at Bandung. The first was that China would help the rest of the emerging world. And secondly, even though China would help, and help very greatly, China would not interfere in the internal affairs of the emerging states. This promise was something that China lived up to and has continued to live up to over the years. But it also meant that as China quarreled with the United States, then quarreled with the Soviet Union, its allies were emerging states that did not have great power. China was to a certain extent the most powerful of the emerging states, which put it in a very delicate position. It had promised not to interfere but in what way as the leading state in the grouping was it going to be able to lead? And this eventually led to what the Chinese called the three world theory. This had taken many years to form, but it was enunciated formally in 1974. It coincided with the visit of the Zambian president, Kenneth Kaunda, to Beijing. He had an audience with Chairman Mao and after that audience, it was announced that the three world theory was a joint creation between the Chinese and the Zambians in the presence of Chairman Mao and the discussions that Kaunda had with the Chinese chairman. In fact, this was a gesture towards precisely that developing world, precisely towards Africa, that there was going to be an intellectual partnership which shaped a view of the world in the future. And this world was a confrontational world. You had three parts of this world, 
The so-called First World was the joint First World of imperial outreach, and the Chinese classified this First World as consisting of both the United States and the Soviet Union. The Second World was that world between the First and the Third World, and that was up for conversion. That was up for competitive outreach. The Third World were the emerging states led by China. So China and the emerging states would try to court the Second World, the world of Europe, the world of parts of the Latin American development region, try to bring them away from the outreach of the imperial powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. But implicit in this view of the world was that China could somehow protect the Third World as well as leading the Third World, and it was unable to do so. The turning point was in 1979 when the Soviets, to everybody's surprise, invaded Afghanistan, setting into motion a long train of events with which we still live today. But the Chinese, like the Americans, were taken by surprise and could do nothing. And so it seemed that the promise to lead and to protect the emerging third world was a hollow one. The abandonment of the three world theory, not officially abandoned, but to all intents and purposes abandoned, took place shortly after the Afghan invasion on the part of the Soviet military forces. But it meant that the Chinese were still searching for a way of engaging with the world. They were distrustful of the Americans, although a rapprochement in the early 1970s had been reached with them. It was only really towards the end of the 1970s that the Chinese decided they had better take this rapprochement seriously. And they did. That rapprochement in 1971 and 1972 had a very, very colorful history. The advent of so-called ping-pong diplomacy in 1971, the secret visit of Henry Kissinger to China, where he found he got on extremely well intellectually as well as personally with Prime Minister Zhao Enlai, and then the visit in 1972 of President Nixon to China to great fanfare and the inauguration of a rapprochement, which, as I said, was very slow to develop and only really began to get serious Chinese attention at the end of the 1970s. However, the Chinese continued to see themselves in some kind of rivalry with the Americans. It was a very, very curious relationship. For the Chinese, everything that America was epitomized what development was meant to be. The glamour of Hollywood, the fast cars, the great skyscrapers, all of this was not only a modernity, but it was also a beautiful modernity. It was an aspiration. It was what the Chinese model wanted one day to become. You can see that in the way the Chinese cities have developed since that time. Look at Shanghai, for instance, the constant building of new cities, the constant rebuilding of Beijing. All of these things are a reflection of China being a rival of the United States, but at the same time having U.S. modernity as an aspirational model which it wishes to attain. Gone now, however, are the days of a military rivalry, Gone now are the days of diplomatic isolation, but the competition has taken on a new turn, and that is it's become an economic competition. The full-fledged adoption by the Chinese underneath Deng Xiaoping's four modernizations, that is the decision basically to turn a communist economy into a capitalist economy and to make it a competitive capitalist economy, and to make it into a capitalist, globally competitive economy was a turning point in world history which I think many people, even now, do not properly appreciate. But we can no longer, for instance, talk about capitalism and globalization as a Western phenomenon. It's now competitive. The Chinese are here. It would seem that in their G20 summit, which they'll be hosting later this year in September, uh, the Chinese architecture for the financial future of the world will be unveiled in all of its clarity. And it's going to be a full-on challenge to American 
economic domination of the world, which we've seen hitherto, but the new Chinese fiscal, financial, economic and trading institutions will be set up very, very much to craft alternative models to Western and in particular US economic hegemony. The alacrity with which the Chinese bought American toxic debt during the economic meltdown of 2008 meant that they were anxious not only to rival the Americans but to have leverage in the American economy and now they have that kind of leverage. It promises a very, very interesting diplomatic, economically based competition for the remainder of the 2000s.